welcome. This is calm down to the White House. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic is a disruption and actually a distraction that has shaken the political and economic landscape of the world to its very foundation. In the United States, for instance, the massive disruption will for a long time reshape how national politics is played side by side global politics. Who becomes the next president of the most powerful country on earth will have to decide swiftly on steps that must be taken to rebuild the economy and create jobs for the millions of jobless Americans. Now, the candidates, Republican or Democrat, will have to decide on what strategic action plan to adopt to help reintegrate a vast population of African Americans who, going by statistics, have suffered the most in the COVID-19 pandemic job loss. But while Americans would expect a very compact policy outlay from the candidates, the moral question is one that may require some urgent answers. Now, what is it about the US presidential candidates and their past catching up with them? For instance, Vice President Joe Biden, the presumptive Democratic nominee, is being trailed by a woman accusing him of sexual assault. And even the incumbent president, Donald Trump, a Republican, had his share of many such allegations of sexual assaults. On the show today to speak for the Republican Party via Skype is Dr. Christopher Messler. He is of the Black Economic Security Today Trust, a United States special interest whose mandate is to secure the economic security of black people globally. Joining me in the studio is Professor Pat Otome, a political economist and management expert, a former presidential candidate in Nigeria, and the founder of Center for Value in Leadership. Also joining me is Frank Ayabogun. He is a media mogul and the publisher and chief executive officer of a print and online media group, The Business Day. And I am your sincerely Eshomamo Imodo. You may choose to call me Esh. I'll be your guide through this auspicious countdown to the White House. Please do stay with us. The pandemic is unlike other natural disasters. Outbreaks can happen simultaneously in hundreds or even thousands of locations at the same time. And unlike storms or floods, which strike in an instant and then recede, a pandemic can continue spreading destruction in repeated waves that can last for a year or more. And one day many lives could be needlessly lost because we failed to act today. This vital issue to the health and the safety of all Americans, I'm here to discuss our strategy to prevent and protect the American people from a possible outbreak. First, we must detect outbreaks that occur anywhere in the world. Second, we must protect the American people by stockpiling vaccines and antiviral drugs and improve our ability to rapidly produce new vaccines against a pandemic strain. If and when, a new strain of flu, like the Spanish flu, crops up five years from now or a decade from now, we've made the investment. And we're further along to be able to catch it. The funding we're asking for is needed to keep strengthening our capacity here at home so we can respond to any future Ebola cases. It's needed to help us partner with other countries to prevent and deal with future outbreaks and threats before they become epidemics. We were lucky with H1N1 that it did not prove to be more deadly. We can't say we're lucky with Ebola because obviously it's having a devastating effect in, effect in West Africa, but it is not airborne in its transmission. There may and likely will come a time in which we have both an airborne disease that is deadly. And in order for us to deal with that effectively, we have to put in place an infrastructure, not just here at home, but globally, that allows us to see it quickly, isolate it quickly, respond to it quickly. You know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat, as the heat comes in. Uh, typically, that will go away in April. This moment, we think we have it very much in hand. What we've done is, uh, in 
Tony had said numerous times that uh, we've saved thousands of lives because of the quick closing. Uh, and when you say me, I didn't do it. Uh, we have a group of people. I could, I could ask perhaps my administration, but I could perhaps ask uh, Tony about that because uh, I don't know anything about it. Some of the people we cut, they haven't been used for many, many years. And if we, they, if we ever need them, we can get them very quickly. And rather than spending the money, and I'm a business person, I don't like having thousands of people around when you don't need them. You're welcome back. Now, Dr. Christopher, it's nice you're joining us Good here morning. on Countdown to the White House. Now, you, you listen to the, uh, the clip, uh, the three uh, presidents in America, the form, two former presidents and President uh, uh, Trump also. Now, key issues were yeah. raised in those clips, talking about preparedness of America. Now, America is one country that touts itself as the policeman of the world. And... Uh, some people have said that how come such thing as COVID-19, the coronavirus, escaped uh, uh, the consciousness of America? Now, I have uh, one of my friends here in the studio that is going to help uh, uh, throw the question at you. So I'd like you to respond to the question from Professor Patu Tomi. Prof. Well, 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 thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to see that uh, we can confront this issue head on because uh, many serious observers are appalled, really, truly appalled, that something like a pandemic, which Americans should be very sensitive to, because we know that the population of North America, native North America, was literally wiped out 99% by disease. So surely if there's any group of people who should be sensitive to the impact of disease, it should be the American people. President George W. Bush showed that, if you will, a commitment to understanding that problem. Uh, President Obama followed up. But it kind of just seems like President Trump makes a joke of it all. I mean, most of the remarks he has made around this, like uh, disinfectant being uh, a way of washing it out, and seem like he's not serious. Is there an explanation for why he's approaching something as serious as a pandemic the way he has been doing? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on the show. But as it relates to this conversation about the president not being serious, that is absolutely not correct. The president has moved quickly uh, in getting this under control. Listen, this virus is very different. It mutates uh, very quickly. And so the president has been working to get this done and get it done effectively. And so can people criticize him and say that he should have moved faster? Absolutely. They criticize every president. I don't think this president thinks this is a joke at all. I guess we had issues with uh, the the... the, the Okay. Now, no, 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 no. Frank, you have something to say? Yeah. I, 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 uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Christopher. I, I think it's good um, to provide a defense for the President uh, Donald Trump, uh, that is. But um, if he were to have been that prepared as you have suggested, why is he at war with everybody? He's at war with his officials, including Dr. Fauci. He's at war with China. He's at war with the WHO. He's at war with the rest of the world. That does not suggest to me as a journalist, like um, a leader who is uh, prepared and, um, uh, in my view, he's been very cavalier with, um, with, with, with approaching uh, coronavirus. Well, the suggestion that he's at war with everyone has been um, a comment that has occurred from the beginning of his presidency. The president has a very different way of approaching a number of these issues. People don't like his style. I understand they don't like his style, but that's not the issue. Um, the president has disagreement. Uh, he's moving to get testing done. He's working with the states. 
And that's the end of that. Look, people don't like the president because they don't like the president. And that's fine. But let's look at what the results are going to be. You say that they don't like the president when Republican governors are saying that's not the way we should go. Surely there should be some harmony even within the Republican Party so that Republican governors are going to be able to say to the president, well, let's meet on this. You're not traveling the right track. How could we do things differently? But that's, that doesn't seem to be that. that that's wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Um, as it relates to Republican governors, the president has been working with several Republican governors, including the governor here in Florida. Um, and, and so as it relates to that, and should there be harmony? Yes, this is politics. And in politics, oftentimes, harmony does not exist. That's the nature of politics, particularly in a contentious election year. But you talked about that. You said he, he's been working with a lot of governors, but how well has he worked with uh, the former president? And there's another clip I would like you to listen to, uh, former President Obama, what he, uh, how he described the way President Trump is handling the COVID-19. Uh, Just listen and you tell us how well has he uh, worked with the former presidents? The response to this global crisis has been so anemic and spotty and uh, it would have been bad even with the best of governments. It has been an absolute chaotic disaster. Uh, when that uh, mindset of what's in it for me uh, and to heck with everybody else, when that mindset is operationalized uh, in our government. Okay, uh, uh, Frank. Yeah, I, I, I was hoping he would respond uh, to that clip, but let me ask. I mean, I, I think, Dr. You, 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 you put it out already. This is all about politics. So um, perhaps all we're seeing is uh, Trump's um, prioritization of his re-election at the risk of um, uh, the health and uh, well-being of uh, his people, and indeed, I dare say, no. the rest of the world as well. No. No, no, absolutely not. So let's go specifically to the clip um, of President Obama. First of all, this was supposed to be um, a private conversation with uh, uh, Obama alumni. Yeah, right. Um, the former president knew that this would be leaked, number one. Uh, number two, there is a political aspect of this. It is politics. Um, and so as it relates to what the president has done, what has happened is people have taken everything that he's done, everything that he's said, and criticized him as being incompetent. Listen, uh, the president is working as effectively as he can under the circumstances. He continues to do so. His concern is about two things the health and welfare of Americans and making sure that during the pandemic and after we continue to be a strong economy. It is twofold. It is not either or. It is both and. Yes, but if, if we take the fact that a very important constituency, the African-American constituency has been severely affected by the pandemic, a lot more African Americans have died uh, in, in the course of this pandemic. But I, I don't see any articulated program to win that constituency over as one that the president really cares a lot about and would like to take advantage, if you will, advantage maybe is not the right word, would like to show that commitment in how he engages the well-being of the African-American who seems to be suffering more from this, which leads us to the great question of inequality in the world and in America particularly. Uh, the, the problems of inequality are essentially very visible from this pandemic, whether it's in the UK or the United States, you see that 
uh, a lot more people who have poorer access to healthcare are suffering from the effects of the pandemic than those who have better access because they are well off. Well, and, and in that case, again, let me add some context and some color. You're talking about the idea of health care disparities, which has existed in the, the American system before Trump became president. As it relates specifically to COVID-19 and as it relates to health care disparities, they are, in fact, um, some work that's being done in healthcare disparities as it relates to African Americans and other minorities. I will say that the president and the administration has to do a better job of articulating the healthcare disparities research. Uh, and, and so from that aspect, I think with uh, the Surgeon General, Dr. Adams and others, what has to be done, Dr. Carter, um, are conversations about the healthcare disparity research that is coming up. But, but, but there seemed to have been criticism of the Surgeon General when he drew attention to that because he is African American. Did you real, uh, notice that what? criticism of him that he should have appointed to eat? That it was like he was being parochial. Should that be well, he was not being the, the approach to that rather than that an appropriate officer has pointed to some challenge that needed to be dealt with? Well, and, and in fact, he was not being parochial. And in terms of the language that he used, Let's be realistic. African Americans use that language to describe their families all the time. The fact that he said it, being the Surgeon General, is simply another attempt to criticize work rather than look at outcome. Is, is there virtue, or could it be the Republican game plan, um, what Trump has done, to destroy, as it were, uh, what was left of multilateralism, uh, which, in my view, uh, has now climaxed in his attempt to bring down the World Health Organization? Well, I, I, I don't believe that the, pre the president um, is trying to build to bring down the WHO. I, I absolutely don't believe that. Um, and I, I, I think as it relates to relations across the world, I um, there How is it that what matters the most for the WHO at this time, which is adequate funding, Trump has pulled the plug? Well, as it relates to, to funding um, relative to the WHO, he made decisions to um, get out of certain aspects of the WHO. The question becomes, is there room in Congress to do otherwise? Okay. Uh, 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 th thank you for that. Um, uh, Prof, you, you, ha you have another line of question you want to raise? Well, uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I, I, I was just going to get to this, uh, for me, very irritating part of American politics, which is that every election cycle, people just pop up from everywhere and accuse candidates, um, presumptive candidates of sexual harassment. Uh, I believe very much in the rights of women, and I think that I was one of those that supported the Me Too movement. Yeah, but um, I, I think it's getting ridiculous that every election cycle, so much time is wasted on those kinds of issues. Uh, President Trump has a trail of such I don't know how many women now, I lost count, have come out to accuse him. Uh, and some might be germane when they are brought forward, but some just seem like frivolous. Now one person has come out uh, to accuse uh, former Vice President Joe Biden of, of similar. Uh, is this the way to make America's democracy more credible? Yes, public life is about virtue 
public virtue, as Montesquieu said. But um, isn't this getting ridiculous? Is that the kind of issue it's that you should ridiculous. be pushing or would be pushing uh, relative to your candidate versus uh, Vice President Biden? Well, yeah. I mean, look, it, it has gotten ridiculous. This notion of, of, of really bringing up issues of sexual harassment, sexual assault that occurred 28, 29, 30 years ago, um, you know, why did you not bring it out at that time? And, and so as it relates to this, yes, I, I agree that, in fact, women should be heard. However, they should be heard. They've been heard. And um, investigate what you want to do. But in the middle of an election campaign, so before he uh, is running for office, now all of a sudden, you couldn't have said it then, you're saying it now. That destroys the very nature of... Okay. By, by, by the way, just to finish up on that point, there are statutes of limitation for most kinds of offenses. Why not with these kinds of sexual... Maybe that's a legislative uh, area of work that after a certain number of years, seven, ten years, it should be improper to raise such an accusation, especially since it's making Correct. Uh, uh, a big mess of the political process. Yes, I, I, I agree. I mean, and in a lot of these cases, there are statutes of limitations anyway. So they can't win in the court of law, so they bring it into the court of public opinion and politics. That's nonsense. Okay, if we, if we may just shift yes. uh, to immigration. immigration. Yes. Frank, you're gonna, uh, yes. Okay. Um, Last week or two weeks ago, President Trump had a telephone conversation with the Nigerian leader, President uh, Muhammadu Buhari. Um, and I think uh, that's probably as it should be, given the um, significant uh, uh, um, proportion of um, you know, uh, uh, Nigerians that are residents uh, in the United States. Um, but as a journalist, um, I, I'm, I'm quite cynical about things like this. In that conversation, Trump did promise um, to send some ventilators uh, to Nigeria. Um, and I'm asking myself, this is the same people that he has assaulted so, 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 so outrageously by asking them to stay back at home in Nigeria, deny them uh, a legitimate uh, uh, opportunity to travel and work in America. And it's a question of, well, you stay back home, we send some ventilators to you. Is that the case? No, I don't, I, I, I don't believe that, that that's the case at all. As it relates to immigration, um, the question of immigration in the United States is a question that still needs to be comprehensively uh, discussed and decisions need to be made. Um, my fear is that the whole idea of immigration is becoming too far politicized that we need to get to the point where we can have conversations about immigration um, without uh, injecting all of the unnecessary politics. But, but, but if we take that further, what we find is that the very basis for the Trump policy, which is that you don't want the dregs of the world ending up in America, and you look at the Nigerians who are coming to America uh, are some of the finest. It's not even in Nigeria's interest that they go to America. Because if you look at it, I mean, seven of ten black doctors in America is Nigerian. And here we need doctors. But, but this is the quality that Nigerians have brought to America. So if this is the quality, how come the president who has, as the core of his immigration policy, such, such people continue to talk down at Nigerians and forgetting that they constitute a very critical part of that work, workforce that makes America roll? Well, I, I, I think from the standpoint of um, the continent of Africa, from the standpoint of Nigerians in particular, um, I think, in fact, the administration 
can use some more education as to the value of the relationship um, between the continent of Africa um, and the skills of Nigerians as an example. I have no argument with you there on that. I do believe, in fact, that that kind of uh, conversation and engagement of the administration is critical. We have no, I have no argument there with you. If, if, if you don't have any argument then, how do you defend Trump's um, you know, position on this? Well, here's what I'm saying. What I am saying is there, has, there is not enough of an education of the administration on the value of the continent of Africa, period. And so from my perspective, one of the most productive things that can be done is a conversation with the continent of Africa and the administration about the value of that relationship. In my view, that simply hasn't been done. But it can't. It can be done, and there has been effort to move in that direction. I, I recall at the uh, Republican National Convention in Tampa, Florida in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was present, and I, I, I engaged then New Jersey Governor Chris Christie on that mm -hmm. subject matter. Uh, we see a president, George W. Bush, not often given the credit mm -hmm. for how much he tried to engage Africa. And so there is even a Republican tradition of engaging Africa better. But this has not become part of the Republican Party plank going forward. It seemed like a George W. Bush personal thing. How does the party justify not being able to take a good idea further forward? Well, there are a number of good ideas that the party has not uh, taken forward. And, and, and that, again, happens from administration to administration. From my perspective and from my ability to talk with the administration, I am certainly willing to engage that conversation again. It is not only the administration, it is also the Republican National Committee, um, it is also Best Trust Fund, it is all of those organizations, particularly as we talk about not only immigration, but issues of trade. Given everything that's going on in China, China is buying raw materials from Africa. Um, and China has its own issues relative to trade and the United States. So there could be a discussion, for example, on how America buys the raw materials directly um, and engages the continent uh, as a trading partner. These are all issues worthy of exploring, and I think certainly we'll have um, a listening and open air um, in all aspects and parts of the party. Okay, uh, th thank you, Dr. Christopher. Now, uh, in the second half, we'll be taking a look at uh, the international politics, talking about the relationship between America and uh, Africa and also China, the rising profile of China. Then also we will play the clip of uh, our last guest, a Democratic representative that was on the show with us last week. Please, let's go and break.